Hey everybody, this is John for MTG Nexus. Hopefully we'll be able to get through this entire video before my voice gives out. I do apologize for lack of content the last couple of days. I've been having a rather nice head cold with chest cold and laryngitis to boot. Uh, this is the list that we played in the last set of videos. It's also the list that I played in this league, as well as the modern format quarter three championships. Um, no changes, I still think the list is fine despite the uh, rough go of things in the uh, format playoff, which I'll cover in another video. And I also would like to give a shout out to our new patrons on Patreon, uh, Andrew Wurchin, uh Anthony Shaw Jr., and Kater Katernsti, K-A-T-A-E-R-N-S-T-I. Big shout out to our new $1 Goblin Guide patrons. They get access to our sideboard guide for this list, which I update with more and more matchups as we go along. And I also update it twice a month. So, And it's a great way to get support from you guys while also giving back to the community. So huge shout out to our new patrons. A special thank you to all of you who have been our patrons for a while. And as a reminder, if you're a $10 a month Patreon, we do our... Uh, deck we'll play for them and uh, you know, donation deck that was the word I was thinking of I'm <laughs> fighting with the cold medicine right now so things are going to be a little bit loopy this league um, so with that let's go over the list uh, for those of you that didn't look at the last video basically it's very similar to the list we've been running except we've cut a skewer of the critics in a certain blaze get two copies of skull crack into the thing um Burn's kind of a known quantity in the current format. Uh, it's considered one of the decks to beat, and when one of the decks it becomes one of the decks to beat, it usually becomes targeted with things like life gain. I've seen anything from a through the breach uh, red green Valakit deck, uh, running four obstinate Bayloth main to life goes life goes on to weather the storm out of Jun decks. Um, obviously, wars a combo can be a problematic thing if they get a bunch of life gain. Um, etc. So, I think it was time to bust out the Skull Cracks in addition to all the Stoneforge Mystic decks running around. It's a great way to blink and attack from a uh, Batter Skull token from getting life for a turn, which might be enough to get there. And the only other change is we're down to 19 lands. I did find myself flooding a lot. A lot of people are proponents of the 20 land, 6 can land variety, and I think that's fine, but I think in the current format where pe people are concentrating on getting on the board, and attacking life totals that you can't necessarily take the extra life hit. Plus, I wanted to fit a Grim Lava Mancer in here. Well, I don't think Lava Mancer is fantastic in the current format, and it's a card that I board out in a lot of matchups. I do think it's a good way to fight an on board. Um, if you get this on board turn one, I do think it's a decent way to fight Stoneforge Mystic. A lot of the decks that are running um, Stoneforge Mystic are only running so many removal spells, you know, especially the blue white stone blade versions might be running Path, Winds of Abandon, and that's about it, you know, unless they're on Just Guy. So maybe six to eight ways to kill this, whereas, you know, Force of Negation plus Batter Skull plus uh, Stoneforge Mystic can be GG in a lot of spots. So I think having another way to combat that at a relatively low cost in the main deck is nice. And beyond that, a couple core Firewalkers in the sideboard for right now because there are a lot of red decks running around. Um, a lot of people are down on their graveyard heat. I personally hate losing to Dredge, and while I realize the deck has been considerably weakened, um, I do think there are still graveyard decks out there, plus it can come in against Storm and Wurza. So enough slur I'm freeing up three sideboard slots here to fight those matchups. Um, I don't like losing to the infinite life gain out of Wurza, and I really don't like losing to um, Dredge if we can possibly help it, so hence why I haven't cut all the graveyard heat like a lot of decks have. And also can come in against corner case graveyard decks, which really haven't popped up all that much, as everyone seems to be concentrating on main decks and the battlefield. As a friendly reminder, if you like what you're seeing on the channel, please consider subscribing, giving us a thumbs up, leaving a constructive comment down below, as we aim to become the most informative Lightning Bolt-based channel in Modern. And as another shout-out going forward, um, I'll be switch starting my new work schedule this week, so content might be popping up later in the evenings as opposed to the mornings and such. Uh, we'll wait and see how that goes. Um, I will be doing a Just Guy control donation deck list from Space Marine this week, as well as hopefully a burn versus matchup, which the last time I checked the voting wanted to see Warza first. And then we'll also get into a Phoenix uh, 
build later this week, I'm probably going to continue working on the Traverse Phoenix build, or maybe work on the 5-0 list that finally popped up for Arclight Phoenix. Anyways, let's get into the matches. That's what you're here for, after all. So this league was done getting ready for the modern format playoff, and I believe this league also um, helped us clinch the last point we needed for the modern format play playoff, so spoiler, this league will at least be a 3-2. Um, this opening hand's pretty good. Um, we're lacking a one-drop creature, but we are on the draw anyway, which obviously is a bit behind, and an Eidolon, generally a pretty good follow-up to a Rift Bolt here, so. Opponent goes Hallowed Fountain Pass, which Hallowed Fountain decks are usually pretty reasonable unless they're a Stone Blade variant, um, so obviously this is some type of control list, most likely. Uh, they might have something like Mana Leak or something here, but I still feel like jamming this. They do have the Mana Leak. It's unfortunate we really can't play around it a ton. Uh, Teferi Time Reveler here, they choose to plus it wisely so. Um, this makes this game a lot harder. Um, you know, we are obviously pretty free to resolve these two spells unless they use a Force of Negation or something. But, um, you know, they choose to minus there, probably looking to hit a land drop. Um, that shows us they're on Esper Control, which is its own all sorts of monkeys. Um, the Cryptic Command us here, I have to bolt them. Um, notably we can't suspend Rift Bolt, so when people ask why I sideboard out Rift Bolt against Blue-White Control, or Blue-White X Control decks, or Stoneforge Mystic decks that they're Blue-White based, this card is the main reason, because you can't suspend this and cast it during your upkeep, you can only s cast spells on your main phase. Go ahead and cast Eidolon, put has another Cryptic Command. Actually being held up on lands this time is a bit of a punishment. The Goblin Guide here, Trigger, they have Snapcaster Mage, um, Target Mana Leak, I'm not sure why they did it that way, but uh, I go ahead and Opt, get in for some damage here, we cast that, they Esper Charm, draw a couple cards. We've gotten them to three, which is nice, but the problem is resolving this last spell is going to be a bit of a pain here. And then they Snapcaster Esper Charm, get rid of our last two cards. And we draw another land, get a Goblin Guide down, we go ahead and do the thing. Uh, they path it anyway. And at this point we're pretty well in trouble. I, yeah, I probably should have actually waited one more draw step. Um, but I think it's a pretty good to assume that they had at least one more counterspell besides this, or maybe even the four Snapcaster Mage, so kind of conceded to this. This Teferi really was a pain in this particular matchup. But anyways, let's get on to sideboarding and match number game number two in this match. So against a blue-white X variant, not bringing in, um, or not likely having a Stoneforge Mystic package, I leave the smashes in the sideboard, board out the Searing Blazes, and a copy of Rift Bolt because it's a Fairy Time Raveler, and boarded in two copies, of the other two copies of Skullcrack and the two copies of Exquisite Firecraft. Firecraft's pretty much here for matchups like this. Try to force few, force through the last couple points of damage. Uh, I'll get to mulligan the sand. Uh, sand doesn't great, but it's workable, especially with the mulliganing down to just the three lands. Go ahead and our Nemesis to Fairy Time Raveler card that I didn't think previously was all that good in these matchups, but it's proven to be quite, uh, quite problematic. Go to combat here. We have purge. I go ahead and do the thing, drop them to eight. They have timely reinforcements, which is unfortunate. Um, we got goblin guide here, just continue to attack. It's possible I was supposed to leave the Eidolon, or attack with the Eidolon here. This puts them to 9. They cast Kaya's Guile. So, we do the thing. We have Force of Negation, which is problematic. Though I'm not really sure why they did that there. They pile onto that, we get them down to 5. Seem to be in pretty good shape here still. Do the thing. We got another creature. 
they cast a Celestial Purge, Fatal Push, we put them to four, they bounce that, Esper Charm us, which is annoying, and then they start beating us down with Colonnades, try to Boros Charm them, they have a Mana Leak, they attack with Colonnade again, put us to two, we draw a land and we're dead, so, the Fairy Time Raveler proving problematic in terms of mana, um, this card's very good in the matchup. Um, if I'm a blue-white control player, I'm probably not boarding it out against again against Burn, as long as I have the cards to support it. And obviously, Esper, they do a little bit more damage to themselves with their mana base sometimes, but they had a relatively painless start this time. I'm a little bit slow, but they had, you know, Timely and Nakaya's Guile. There's a lot of a lot of tools for them in the matchup. Um, felt like this build was pretty well tuned to beat Burn. Um, they did have Teferi Time Raveler, obviously, to pretty good effect a couple times. So, um, not a card to underestimate. It's a card that I've been seeing kind of an uptick in with these Blue-White Stoneforge lists. We even saw it out of our Esper Groyo's opponent when I was playing um, Arclight Phoenix the last time out. So, a card that uh, makes it a lot harder to interact with. Um, and, you know, kind of takes away one of big Burn's big advantages against Control Decks being able to play you know, end step into the following turn, um, kind of overload their mana and their counter spells. Uh, very positive card, and then Colonnade obviously kind of closing out the game. But, anyways, on to match number two. Here for match number two, we'll be on the play. This hand's obviously a pretty easy mulligan. This hand's borderline, especially in the play, but I think already mulliganing to six. This my hand might be a keep pitching the Grim here. So, go Goblin Guide, attack. Let's see what our opponent reveals here. Blooming Marsh. Alright, so... Um, Seal Cart Yard's a bit of a weird one. A Path. Good for us, because we actually needed that land. I go Stone Forge Mystic. Just kill the Mystic. Don't mess around with Batter Skull here. Get the Eidolon down. Suspend the Rift Bolt. When it plays out, Lingering Souls to kind of keep the Eidolon in check. Um, it's possible that I'm supposed to attack with Eidolon here, but I choose to leave it back. Maybe that's incorrect. I'm supposed to get these Lingering Souls off the board here. Especially when in the face of this Goblin God, which would have been nice to being able to. I was supposed to attack here. I don't know why I'm not attacking. Um... Pass turn here. Opponent doesn't attack either. I guess they're afraid of us double blocking their thing, which feels foolish, but, you know, then we get lucky and still manage to kill them with the skewer of the critics, you know, getting them for nine damage over here. They definitely should have attacked with that. I think they suspected we had a skull crack, but still correct to attack with this germ, even to a du potential double block here. But, Abzan Stoneforge, quite an interesting deck. Um, we started out with two rather grindy matchups right off the bat, so format seems like it might be shifting a little bit. But anyways, on to game number two. So our opponent showed us Stoneforge Mystic, and I chose not to board in Smash to Smithereens, and that may be incorrect, and I also boarded out a Grim Lava Mancer. Um, I left in... What did I? I boarded out two Boros Charms, and a Lava Mancer and a Skewer for two copies of Skull Crack and two copies of Searing Blood. Um, given the fact that we're up against Abzan, the Searing Blood was probably incorrect, and I should probably have boarded in these Path to Exiles. But I guess suspecting that they had Lingering Souls and such, I figured Searing Blood would have enough targets, but probably should have boarded in the two Paths and the two Skull Cracks, and maybe the Smashes, as opposed to what I ended up boarding in here. <clears throat> Us hands reasonable, but does have the downside of um, being a one lander, so I can't recall. I guess I end up keeping this one. Oh, because we're on the draw. That makes it a little bit easier. Um, go ahead and do the 
Goblin Guide thing, they Fatal Push it, which is unfortunate. If they were to path it, we would have been a lot better off. They have the Stone Forge Mystic here. Um, we don't draw the lands, we just go ahead and bolt the Stone Forge so they don't like, drop Batter Skull on our heads. But I think at this point we're going to be really far behind, especially when they have a Liliana. Finally draw the second land, pass turn here. Get rid of the Searing Blaze. Once again, keeping in mind that they have the Batter Skull coming up. At this point, we're just trying to get them dead before they can get that Batter Skull on attack. You know, they cast Batter Skull here. Have to get a little bit fortunate, and I think we would need to... We needed to be able to grab a um, Skull Crack here in this, which was somewhat unlikely given there's only two in our 47 card deck at that point. We needed to, like, Skull Crack and, like, Boros Charm or something. Um, definitely a risk with this one lander that we kept. Um, some It's a habit I really need to stop and consider. I think on the draw it was a fine gamble, but these one landers a lot of times will come back to bite me, especially um, one of my games in the modern playoff that came back to bite me as well. A lot of people have commented that I gamble a lot of times on these one land hands. I think on the draw it's perfectly defensible, but sometimes I gamble a little bit too heavily on these one landers, and it doesn't pan out when you only have 18 lands in your 50 some card deck, so you're like 40 or some percent chance to draw the card you need. So, anyways, on to game number three. Here we are for game number three. We'll be on the play. Did I change sideboarding at all? No, nope, looks like. I guess I boarded out the Searing Bloods for. What did I board in here? Brought the Boros Charms back in, it looks like. I'll look in that first hand. This hand's alright here. Um, putting back a land, this hand gets a lot more respectable. Back the Mesic Mountain. Start getting in with the Swift Spear here. Having a skull crack as an opening is kind of nice. Inquisitions us, takes the Eidolon. We get another skull crack. Um, skull cracking here might have been incorrect, especially in the face of something like potentially a collective brutality. Um, our opponent, fortunately, doesn't have any such thing to punish us. They path the thing. I just go ahead and pull the trigger on the lava spike here. Once again, being a little bit generous with not um, holding up skull crack through these early turns, something like a timely reinforcements or a collective brutality could certainly have got us. Tireless tracker here, they're on board, but we do have a couple of draw steps at least to try to kill them. We're flooding out a little bit, they start getting on board with the tracker. That fetch was probably ill-advised. Um, even with a Stone Forge Mystic here, because that leaves them dead to most spells in our deck. Eidolon is not the spell we were looking for, but it is a chump blocker. Uh, they continue to get a bunch of clues. We go ahead and do that. They Liliana us. We go ahead and skull crack them. And then the extra land we drew. Fill this out. Uh, they crack a clue, I'm not sure what they would have been able to find there, and then we kill them with a Searing Blaze. So, started to flood out a little bit there. Um, like I said, a little bit dangerous not necessarily holding up Skull Crack in those early turns, because the Abzan deck is certainly something that could have had something like a Skull Crack, or not Skull Crack, a Collective Brutality on the sideboard, which that little bit of life might have been enough to keep them in the game, um, and them cracking that one fetch land was probably not a wise idea and may have actually cost them the game here because um, we were able to kill them exactly before they could get the batter skull down um, they did grab yeah they did grab batter skull so they would have been able to put in got batter skull into play um, so a little bit risky by our opponent but you know difference between seven and six is basically boros charm or two other three damage burn spells so it might have been incorrect from our opponent to fetch there um, I understand trying to thin your deck, trying to find threats, but when you're trying to buy time against burn, uh, anything in integrals of three is important, so that is something to keep in mind, and this Liliana pressures our hands, so they're going to know pretty much face up what we draw here, 
So, got a little bit lucky to draw the final spell on the final turn, but, you know, when we only have, like, eh, ten or so lands left in our deck and four of them are re redraws, we have a pretty good chance of being able to kill them here, but sometimes, you know, leaving the fetch land in play is important for a top deck certain blaze, and we got a little bit lucky here. Anyways, we'll be back for match number three. Hey, we're back for match number three in this league. We're on the draw, unfortunately. Wow, that was a little bit fast. So we kept this hand, we see Black Cleave Cliffs out of our opponent, um, and obviously it was pretty reasonable, we did draw one more land than we actually wanted here. We go ahead, crack the fetch land, start by casting Lava Mancer, because we suspect our opponent had a removal spell, since they just kind of did the thing there. There's a Tarmagoofy. Play Night Alone out here, kind of puts our opponent on the back foot whether they want to attack or not. They go ahead and bolt, deal themselves some damage, get some extra things in the graveyard. Go ahead and lava man goblin guide here. See Verdant Catacombs. Cast Lava Spike. Unfortunately we did grow the goif, but we can't risk our spells getting stuck in our hand at this point. Opponent plays a scooze, which obviously is a little bit scary. Um go ahead eat something, try to bolt it, they eat it, and at that point we're just pretty much dead here, so we scoop it up, losing game number one to Jund. Um, obviously they had a pretty reasonable start, a couple lightning bolts, able to answer our first couple creatures, and then disruption into Goyf is usually their best game against us, that's why some people argue that possibly you should bring in Rest in Peace against them, um, but you do take a whole turn off to cast Rest in Peace, and at that point in time, you're still getting beat down by a note by a two-two. So, anyways, on to game number two. Sideboarding for game number two, we board out the Searing Blazes and a Grim Lava Mancer. Board in two copies of Rest, or not two copies of Rest in Peace, two copies of Path to Exile, and two copies of Skull Crack, hoping to dissipate things like Collective Brutality and uh, Life Gain from. Uh, Scavenging use as well as trying to play around weather the storm should they happen to be running it out on the sideboard. This hand is most excellent, bunch of one drops. Um, most Jun can deal with one of these on the play, um, either via an Inquisition or a removal spell. Opponent reveals a Lightning Bolt. They choose to leave up Lightning Bolt. We get both of our Swift Spears in play. Opponent has a Bolt. They decide to kill one of the. Um, Swiss Spears, which kind of leads me to believe that they're laid on lands, that Peatland basically confirms it. You take away a Boros Charm here. And there's a Fatal Push, once again, they must be laid on lands. Not the most beneficial turn, we suspend Rift Bolt and hold up Lightning Helix. Not uh, Path Exile in case they have a Tarmogoyf here. We know they have a Bolt, so we're not going to be attacking anymore with uh, Goblin Guide here, no reason to. Way our opponent just cracks the peat land, buys them an extra turn. Obviously they're stuck on lands here, which is very good for us. We're starting to flood out a little bit, which is bad. They finally kill the goblin guide, and then they scoop it up. But I guess they figure they're stuck on lands, they're not drawing lands, it's time to scoop it up because eventually we'll draw enough spells to kill them. <laughs> that is the issue sometimes with John, especially with the uh, Ren and Six versions. You're playing stuff like Nurturing Peat Land and Baron Moor kind of messes with their mana base a little bit. Uh, Peatland obviously deals them damage. They don't have any green mana for green spells when they're cracking it. And uh, Baron Moore comes into play tapped. I noticed this when I was playing at the MCQ as well, that sometimes when they're stuck on a two-lander and nurturing Peatland's their green source, it really comes back to bite them in the backside against a deck like Burr. Anyways, on to game number three. We're here for game number three. Be on the draw this one, unfortunately. And this hand's perfectly reasonable. Suspend the Rift Bolt on one and idle on. Regardless of whether our opponent has a discard spell. They obviously have the Inquisition. They mulligan to six, so that's at least good for us. We find a better one drop in Monastery Swift Spear. They, once again, appear to be having mana issues. And no kill spell for uh, Monastery Swift Spear here. And then it looks like they might have scooped here. It 
Yep, looks like they might have scooped here is the point. Um, if they don't have any additional mana sources, this would have been 8 damage coming in next turn in addition to 8 more damage. So um, this would have been 4, 8, 12, 16, 17 damage, putting them to 1. So we would have been risking the turn 3 kill if they uh, didn't have an answer to this and didn't draw additional mana, which it looks like they may have been stuck on mana here. So rather quick, brutal end to a dip more, one of the more difficult matchups for Burn in terms of the Faradex. Uh, once again, though, Jun's three-color mana base comes back to bite them again again a bit. Uh, decks like Green Black Rock are a little bit slower at closing out the game, but their mana deals them less damage. So in so a lot of the Green Black X circles, a lot of people feel that Green Black, X, Green Black Rock has a better matchup than Burn against Burn than Jun does. Uh, Jun deals themselves a lot of damage. They're playing Ren and Six for value. Ren and Six doesn't really impact the Burn matchup all that much. Um, gets them back lands, basically. And can occasionally kill a Grim Lava Mancer or finish off something else. Like maybe a 3-4 Monster East with Spear or something. But um, Ren and Six, their new addition to Jun, really doesn't do a whole lot in the matchup. So them stretching their mana base for the value cards really doesn't do anything to aid them in this matchup. And they often need cards like Collective Brutality or Weather the Storm to win the matchup, and obviously they didn't see any, and they're stumbling on lands. And Burn is one of the best decks in the format of capitalizing on stumbling. So, let's go on to match number four. Here we are for match number four in this league, game number one. Sand, um... Obviously has the potential to be a very quick start with Monster, Swiss Spear, and a bunch of one-mana spells. Uh, does have the risk of potentially flooding out with three lands and none of them being any of the can canopy lands. However, I do think this is a hand worth keeping. So opponent leads on expiring vantage. They bolt it. Shocks in, plays idle on here. We go ahead and pass. Let them do the thing. Tack in. So I take a bit of damage here, which may not be the wisest course of action, but here they kind of force our hand. Uh, the second copy of Eidolon, I bolt the first Eidolon in response. Don't want to take the additional damage to shock in and do the... Um, do the lightning helix the previous turn. And I kill this second Eidolon before they can untap with Boros Charm mana. So I really don't feel like having that come back to hit us. They helix us. So they're both left with three cards. We have four cards. They're at a higher life total. Go ahead and suspend some Rift Bolts here. When it passes, we hit them with a couple copies of Rift Bolts. Lava spike them down to nine. They cast Lightning Helix, sure. We continue to pass. Wondering what's going on here. They have another copy of Lightning Helix. They play a Fiery Islet, which means they're, you know, on a slightly more aggressive version of Burn. And they play Rattle Chains. It's like, okay. Rattle Chains? Bunch of Burn spells. Then you realize Eidolon's a spirit. Anyways, in response to the trigger, we go ahead and double Searing Blaze this, putting them to one. They untap, play Flooded Strain, which obviously indicates we are not dealing with regular burn here. I held this Goblin Guide thinking that maybe they'd have... Um, Searing Blaze, not understanding that they still weren't uh, a burn deck, that they were just some style of just guy aggressive spirits list. Very interesting build um, up to this point with the Lightning Bolts and the Helixes, and then the Rattle Chains kind of gave it away that they weren't necessarily playing burn. So the reason they weren't casting spells is they didn't have access to blue mana. Anyways, on to game number two. Alrighty, here for sideboarding, kind of realizing something might have been a little up with that Rattle Chains, I boarded out the four copies of 
Boros Charm also borrowed out all the copies of Riftbolt, brought in the Path to Exiles, the Searing Bloods, the Skull Cracks, and the copies of Exquisite. No, I guess then we're going to Exquisite Firecraft. What was the final card I would have brought in? Skull Crack, Searing Blood, Path to Exile, and. Hmm. What was the other card if we didn't bring in Firecraft? So we boarded out eight, two, four, six. Oh, brought in the core Firewalkers. Not completely understanding that they weren't actually a true burn deck. So, anywho, fortunately, kind of the spoiler there that we won this game, but still an interesting enough matchup. Plays out Mausoleum Wanderer. Now things are starting to make a little more sense as to what's going on over there. Opponent passes. We obviously have no intention of blocking here. We play Goblin Guide, start pressuring their life total. Fortunately, they have Lightning Helix, which is fine. I briefly considered bolting it to negate it, but in the end, it's still the same effect, so. Opponent goes ahead and plays Drog Skull Captain. We go to attacks. I take the opportunity to try to bolt uh, Captain. They just let it go. Instead of countering it with that. Then I play Bolt. They decide to sack it to whatever. And then we start playing this weird kind of draw-go game that favors us because we have the creatures in play. They bolt it. I'm not playing these spells to play around uh, Spell Queller, especially Lightning Helix. Um, Spell Queller could be problematic in these spots, and it does feel like they are holding it up. That's why I don't attack in here. Which might have been foolish. They cast a Teferi Time Raveler. I threw a couple burn spells at their face. Burn us, play the Goblin Guide again, go to combat. They have another bolt for it. They play Supreme Phantom. We path to exile it, so now I've kind of ruled out them having Spell Queller. We kill Teferi, so it's more of an... Might have been incorrect to kill Teferi here, but I wanted to be able to keep up the instant speed game. So to me it was more important to get that off the table than to drop them to 6. As we saw in our matchup against Esper, it can be really problematic. Drop them to 6. We draw an Eidolon, play Eidolon, pass turn, and continue to chunk in here. Go ahead and attack. They play Tear, which is an interesting card to bring in against Burn specifically. Now, if they ever play any creature card, um, they play Ether Vial. Wow, they have flooded terribly badly this game. They cast Geist of Saint Draft. We play Swift Spear, go to attack in here. We go to Path, the Mausoleum Wanderer, kills their Geist of St. Draft. Obviously they had the chump block there. And then we're just kind of sitting there going, draw, go, attack in. They have Celestial Purge, we cast Eidolon. They're basically locked out of playing anything that can't come in off of Aether Vial. That tells us right there that they don't have Spell Queller anyway. They go to do this. We Searing Blood them, and while they can sack to avoid taking the damage, then they're just dead to the Eidolon. So. And dead they are. This is an interesting matchup. Um, would have been a lot more fun if we would have been able to see their deck without um, all of the Flood out here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 9 lands plus the Path to Exile. It's a lot, even for that kind of deck. feels like maybe they have 20 to 22 lands, so that feels like the flood out was real. We drew a lot of spells, and maybe um, knocking out this Teferi Time Raveler may or may not have been correct, um, but it would have made a lot of our plays a little bit more difficult. Um, would have made it more difficult to you know, instant speed that Path to Exile to kill their uh, Geist of Saints Craft, etc. So, I think it was worth noting that... Um, I don't always like taking out Planeswalkers, but when I do, um, this Teferi Time Raveler, 
is very, very impactful in the burn matchup, and it might be correct in certain circumstances to spend the resources to kill it. Um, a lot of it depends on, you know, situational stuff, but, you know, it's a card that's problematic, and I decided to take it out at that point. Let me know down in the comments whether you would have taken it out there, but after my, especially my experiences earlier in that league with playing against um, the copies of... Uh, Fairy Time Raveler out of Esper, I think that largely contributed to us losing that matchup besides, you know, my opponent playing well, obviously, but being able to knock cards out of our hand and we couldn't respond, etc. was very problematic. Anywho, on to match number five. We're here for our fifth and final match in this league. We'll be on the draw, unfortunately. This hand's reasonable, um... Don't know how impactful Grim Lava Mancer will be in this kind of matchup. Do have a fetch lane and a couple spells to turn it on, so potentially it could be reasonable here. Punt plays Temple Garden Noble Hierarch. Okay, so it looks like Lava Mancer will be reasonable here. In that case, I run out the Grim. Punt plays the Teferi and bounces it. Mildly annoying. I use the goblin guy here to deal with it. They show us Bird of Paradise, so I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Redeploy Lava Mancer. They show us Stoneforge Mystic. Getting Batter Skull. Another Stoneforge Mystic. Getting Sword of Light and Shadow. I go on the Kill All Stoneforge Mystic plan. Batter Skull obviously can still come down pretty quickly. This is very similar to a deck that I lost to um playing for and that Rift Bolt. Once again, this Teferi being very problematic. Use... I probably could have attacked the with the Lava Mancer against one of these creatures, or one of the uh, things and save the extra point of damage going the face. So the opponent should be at 10 here, but we are staring down a Batter Skull and a Sword of Light and Shadow. I had to be able to get this Teferi off the board to be able to hold up Skull Crack in the future turns. So, lots of creature management here. There's a Batter Skull. Suspend Rift Bolt. Just pass the turn. They go for a rather huge attack here. Um attacks in, we're in a lot of trouble, I chump block, skull crack to hold them to eight, um, this puts them to five, and burn spell, and then go ahead and lava mancer them here. So, the one thing our opponent did here, which was incorrect, which actually cost them the game, is playing and equipping this sort of light and shadow, um, if they just would have held, held up the Spell Queller, we actually would have been in severe trouble because they would have gained the 4 life regardless instead of trying to go for this situation. So holding up the Spell Queller, eating up our um, Skull Crack would have led to them... I don't know if they would have won the game, but they would have been at a much, much better um, life total, and they were definitely ahead on board, so we had to close out the game fairly quickly. Um... At that point, I think we probably would have lost the game had they spell quellered our skull crack, been able to crack in for this four, and then maybe connect on sort of light and shadow another turn. So something to consider is um, understanding both sides of the matchup and knowing what cards can beat you. And our opponent had the win there if they simply would have held up spell queller, especially with us having um, basically just the one card, one two cards in hand. We would have had to have. Um, there was no interaction there that could have played around with two mana, uh, being able to get that spell queller back. So, Lava Mancer is obviously not a threat to kill spell queller on its own. Requires one of our burn spells, and we only had two cards in hand, so we couldn't have both Skull Crack and uh, copies of um, Lightning Bolt or anything to deal with the spell queller itself. So it would have been better to hold up the spell queller from our opponent's perspective, but did enable us to slip in a win here that we probably shouldn't have gotten if our opponent hadn't gone for kind of the overkill with the Sword of Light and Shadow, knowing full well that the Light and Shadow is probably not going to connect anyway, given the fact of um, the Goblin God. I guess wanting to get 
the six life here makes sense, but really four life is effectively pretty good in most spots anyway. So just something to consider. Know what your outs or your opponent's outs are in situations if you're somewhat familiar with our list. So anyways, on to game number two. Against uh, Bant, uh, Stoneforge Mystic Lists, we brought in... All, basically all the anti-creature stuff, the Path to Exiles, the Searing Bloods, the Smash to Smitherines for the uh, Stoneforge Mystic equipment, and we also brought in the Searing Bloods. So eight spells in, Boros Charms and the Rift Bolts out. Once again, I'm kind of in the habit of boarding out Rift Bolts against decks that have a Teferi Time Raveler, because that is a good way to kind of get blown out. Um, once again, our one copy of Grim Lava Mancer has the potential to be very important here. So I cast. They don't have Path to Exile, so we got a little bit lucky there. I don't know if they were trying to bluff or what was going on. Um, attack with Lava Mancer here. Go ahead and skewer them. Suspect or cast Lava Spike. Opponent has Giver of Ruins. Go ahead and do the stuff. Kill the Giver, that way they can't protect their stuff moving forward. They finally show us a path to exile, which is kind of weird because that could have saved them a whole lot of trouble. Uh, they play Teferi, tick it up instead of bouncing Lava Mancer, which we go ahead and do the thing. They continue to bounce up, they gain some life here, which is whatever. It's annoying, but at this point it's just better to get that out of the way. Send them to three here with the Lava Mancer activation. We go ahead and shoot them to one. It could potentially have Spell Queller, so we just get negate the attack. They ha actually have a Coaddle. And then they play Ranger Captain. Which can keep us from playing spells for a turn. Which is what they try to do. We play out the Lava Mancer. They can't trade off here because they don't have a third snow permanent. They bounce the Lava Mancer again, play a Burnington Forge Tender. Uh, we're drawing way too many smashes for my liking. No attacks because this Forge Tender has a free block anyway. They play the Spell Quiller we suspected they had all along. Once again, they just kind of pass. We play a Goblin Guide. Possibly should have attacked there, but they have a Path to Exile anyway. I don't have the ability to activate the Grim Lava Mancer because we have no fuel in our graveyard. This game feels like it could turn fairly quickly here if our opponent wants to get aggressive. I bolt. They have a Queller. I was kind of foolish with firing off that bolt. They have a Light and Shadow they equip. Not realizing that that kind of turned on our hand here, so we got a little bit lucky. Um, opponent chose not to use their Forge Tender, which I found kind of weird. If they would have used their Forge Tender here, I think we would have looked. No, I guess they were dead regardless, because they sacked Forge Tender to this. Um, they're dead to the goblin guys, that's why they didn't use it to protect their equipment. And then, you know, if they went on top with that Knight of Autumn, things were just kind of going to spiral out of control from there. They would have more creatures on the board, we can't get back our spells, because Teferi in play. Um, so it was very similar to a deck that uh, knocked me from the ranks of the Unbeaten in round number four of the MCQ a couple weeks ends ago. So, very interesting matchup. Um, their deck is very creature-centric, but I think... The version that I played against probably wasn't running Ranger Captain. Instead, it was running um, copies of uh, Dovin's Veto and Force of Negation in the main, which I think are better in fighting this style of matchup. But this is probably a more value-oriented uh, list than what we were facing than I was placing off against at the MCQ. So, interesting matchup. Uh, I can see how people, you know, want like two, three, four copies of Smash to Smithereens in your hand. Um, the first one's usually really good if you see a Stoneforge Mystic or a piece of equipment. The second and third one's not so much. Um, so, that's why I don't advocate more than two copies of Smash on the sideboard. Uh, 
only other thing we really want smash against besides the, you know the dedicated artifact decks is things like uh, Chalice of the Void. So that's why I really only want to bring in two Smash to Smithereens against these Stoneforge Mystic decks. And as we saw, Teferi Time Rival are just popping up everywhere in this league. Anyways, I'll be back in one second with the final wrap-up for this league. So final wrap-up for this league, I'm still pretty happy with this list. Um, you know, we saw a lot of different things that, that league. We saw a bunch of Stoneforge Mystic decks. We saw um, Teferi Time Raveler. Um, this was in the middle of this past week, so this was after the first re result of uh, Stoneforge Mystic decks not putting up a ton of good results. But still, I think overall, um, Burn's pretty reasonable against the Stoneforge Mystic decks. Um, I think this sideboard set is pretty nice. About the only flex bot that I could see really wanting to mess with right now is like one of these copies of Rest in Peace could be like a third path to exile. Um, maybe a third copy of Smash the Smithereens. I still want some amount of Graveyard Heat for the Dredge decks. I don't like losing to that deck if I can all prevent it. Uh, Core Firewalker obviously can be debatable moving forward. Um, Esburn will probably recede a little bit in the format as people have adapted to Fighting Burn. And it also appears that the um, the results, I'll have to look at, I might make a short video uh, about it. The results of the one uh, GP showed that, or it was SCG Dallas, can't remember what the source of the data, basically that Burn was uh, actually slightly unfavored against Four Color Warza. Um, and I thought the matchup was pretty reasonable. I think the first couple times I played against Warza, I lost to it. And then the last couple times I played against it, I won. And then I played against it during the uh, Modern Format Playoff, which I'll be making a separate video on sometime in the next couple days of the couple of matches that I played during that event. Um, which is the main thing for we've been grinding all these matches and points for was the Modern Format Playoff. And it capped out its 384 person cap. Um, there was a lot of people upset they couldn't uh, participate in the event, but I could tell you by, was it Friday evening at like 6 p.m. or whatever when I registered, there was already 50-some people registered. It was like 12 hours before the event, so it was like, yeah, this event's going to cap. Um, but beyond that, Burn still feels like it's in a pretty good position in the meta. Um, some matchups are a little bit tricky. Uh, the two matchups that I played against at, during the Modern Format Playoff one deck a lot of people think is going to recede, and then the other deck obviously was... Basically, I played against Eldrazi Tron and Four Color Wars Up, and those of you that have followed the channel for quite a while, or even when I did my Versus thing versus Eldrazi Tron, Eldrazi Tron's a really rough matchup, um, and this Modern Format Playoff was no exception. And my list with only like two copies of Path and two copies of Smash, not the best setup to fight that deck, but um, there were some other issues with the matchup, but I'll get into that at another point in time. I want to thank everybody for their support. New Patreons, if you'd like to support the channel, please consider checking out our Patreon, Patreon page. Or if you're new to the channel and you like burnt on content, please consider giving us a, a subscribe here on YouTube. Smash that like button and leave a constructive comment down below. And with that, I'll see you guys for the next video.